Well, we heard um, in the previous um, session that, um, in effect, the ruling ideas of uh, society are the, are the ideas of the ruling class. Clearly, they, they have the economic power. They have the power of the over-education, of uh, the media, and so on. And therefore, they have a powerful influence in moulding public opinion. And this is also the role of, um, of bourgeois economists. Their task is to justify capitalism, basically, and to uh, explain that there are no exploitative relations under capitalism. And that's why they come forward with the idea that uh, economics is based up basically uh, the development of factors of production. So we have uh, you know, land, labor, and capital. You know, the worker gives his labor, gets paid for it. The capitalist invests his capital, he gets a return in profit, and the landlord gets rent, and everybody's happy. That's what's wrong with that. And that's clearly how they try to, to justify things. And above all, uh, the idea of class antagonisms is done away with. Of course, uh, as was explained earlier, that Capitalism didn't always exist, and neither did the modern working class. It came into being, and it came into being in quite a ruthless and bloody fashion, which Marx uh, described as the uh, primitive accumulation of capital, where the uh, peasantry, which existed in Britain, were completely wiped out, driven off the land, um, and were herded into the cities, into the towns where they were forced to work in order to make a living, to survive. And that the capital, that the emerging capitalists were able to uh, gather together, was originally uh, brought about through pillaging, through robbery, through piracy, and other such friendly means. And uh, this is the basis, really, of the development of modern capitalism. Of course, you have these new classes which exist, and the classes brought about by capitalism are two, two fundamental classes. The uh, emerging working class um, had no means of production, which they had previously. That was taken away from them, so they had to work for a living. And the capitalists have a monopoly now over the means of production. And therefore, the capitalists, their workers, have to go cap in hand to the employers in order to get work, in order to earn a wage, in order to feel, feed themselves and their family. It was Lenin, I think, who explained that uh, it was one of the great um, services of Marx was to uh, explain that economics wasn't simply a relationship between things, but it was a relationship between people. In other words, you have to understand what lays beneath the uh, surface, if you like, of capitalism itself, which is, which is seen as an um, enormous amount of commodities and exchange and markets and so on. But what lies beneath that? That's the key question. And for Marx, his whole attempt was to uh, rip away the, the mask, uh, to, to, to drag down the, the veil uh, that covered the real exploitative relations under capitalism and expose the contradictions of capitalist society and to see where these contradictions were leading. Uh, Marx himself um, based himself, first of all, on the, uh, on the great bourgeois economists of the early 19th century, of Adam Smith, <coughs> David Ricardo, and others. And they had a far more scientific view of uh, economy than, the, than we have today. And so far as they came out with an idea, which was developed by Marx, called the labor theory of value. And uh, this is the real basis of, uh, of, uh, of, of Marx's economics. It's a very simple idea that, uh, in essence, the, the value of a commodity, and commodities are things which are produced for sale, 
You know, if we grow potatoes and uh, vegetables in the back garden, they're not commodities, they're things that we consume personally. The capitalists create commodities which are things to be sold for profit. And uh, the, the value of a commodity, as I was explained with these ideas, uh, was determined by the amount of labour or labour time employed in its production, in its creation. Quite a simple idea, but based in, in, a, in a very material uh, surroundings. Uh, today that idea is, uh, is poo-pooed, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's ridiculed, that, that's, that's rubbish, that's out of date. That, uh, the value of things are determined by all, all sorts of questions, including subjective feelings, they say. But this is not uh, um, a view that we would uh, endorse. Um, we start on the basis, it's, it's a science, we have to understand it. And um, if things are going to be exchanged, if commodities are doing to be exchanged, how do they, ex how, how, what basis are they, they, do these exchanges take place? And Marx said, well, it's clearly that, people, uh, that things are exchanged not on the basis of their physical appearance, not because of their colour or their weight or anything else. They must have some, nevertheless, common property that exists for, the, for them to be allowed them to be exchanged. And this common property was the fact that they were products of human labour. And as a result, you can measure human labour. So if a commodity, uh, the value of a commodity is determined by the, the labour time involved in its production, that's a very sound uh, definition of, of uh, the value of a commodity. Of course, we have to understand there are many objections to this by bourgeois economists. Oh, 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 how can that be? Because it means the, mo the most laziest workers would take much longer to produce something, and therefore are you saying that this, would, this commodity would be more valuable than something else? Well, clearly that's not the case. That's a, a silly way of looking at it. Uh, and therefore Marx uh, clarified it. We're not looking at uh, just labour, but the socially necessary labour involved in the production of commodities. In other words, labour with the average technique, uh, the average intensity, the average productivity of the time. And, uh, for instance, if you have an example of, uh, I don't know, uh, a manufacturer uh, who um, produced cloth and over a, over a one hour period they produced 10 yards of cloth. But then you had another manufacturer who used out of date machinery, um, and very bad techniques, but they produced the cloth not in an hour but two hours. But does that mean, therefore, that the value of this cloth is double the amount of the previous uh, factory owner? Of course it doesn't. And if they take the, uh, they both their bales of cloth to market, clearly you've got one uh, bale produced in one hour and another in two hours. Well, the one hour will be cheaper than the two hours and the two hour cloth will not be sold. The market decides then. The market will reject, if you like, uh, commodities which have not got the socially necessary labour involved in their production. Um, so we see that the commodities are, 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 uh, are the value of commodities are determined by labour time, the socially necessary labour time involved in their, their production. Um, commodity uh, production as well uh, uh, is based upon obviously a means by which the capitalist can obtain profit. And uh, this is the conundrum. Where does profit come from under capitalism? Uh, clearly, the working class has to um, sell something to the capitalist in order for them to be employed. They go there, and uh, Marx defined this. What did he sell? First of all, you think, well, does he sell his labor power? I mean, he or she. Does he sell his labor, rather, or does he sell something else? The capitalists always say, well, the, the worker sells his labor and they get paid for this labour, therefore it's a done deal, everything's satisfied. But that's not exactly what happens. When the capitalist employs labour, they employ not, uh, they don't get the, the, the labour of the worker, they get the abilities of the worker they pay for. That's a very important uh, distinction. The abilities of the worker, the labour power of a worker, the energy, the effort that the worker can give to the capitalist is, is bought by the capitalist. And these uh, 
this labor power also has a value insofar as it uh, requires commodities, it requires a sustenance in order to, re to replenish this, la this labor power. Your effort, the energy you've used in one day has to be replenished. And the wages you, wages you get allows you to do this so that you are fit and, and ready for, for work the next day. And that's, that, is a, that is something that the capitalist does genuinely pay the full value for. They pay the full value for the labor power, your effort, your energies that you're prepared to put in to the work. Uh, the only thing is, unlike any other commodity in the world, labor power produces more value than its own value. And uh, of course, uh, this is where the secret of surplus value comes in. This is the secret where profit is made. Insofar as the, the worker themselves uh, gets paid a wage, goes to work, say the working day is what, eight hours a day? And uh, within a space, let's say, for sake of argument, of four hours, the worker produces enough values to cover their wages. Of course, uh, the worker doesn't say, okay, then that's fine, and I'll go home. He's got a contract to work for the eight hours. So he continues to work for an extra four hours. And it is this division of the work in day, which shows there's a part of the work in day which covers wages, which is necessary labor, and it's a part which covers and what is called surplus uh, labor, which produces surplus value for the capitalist. And that is the, where profit comes from. It's through the exploitation of the working class, and profit is nothing more than the unpaid labor of the working class itself. Of course, um, the uh, employer, the capitalist, is only in business to make money. They're only in business to make profits. And therefore, their whole um, drive, if you like, is to maximize the surplus labor that can be squeezed out of the worker. Uh, and they can do this in two particular ways. First of all, they could, if you think about it, they could um, uh, ex extend the working day. So instead of working eight hours, they can say you must work 10 hours. And the worker will produce as normal the four hours of, of value that covers their wages, but now the, work, the employer gets uh, six hours surplus labor. So he's made a bigger extension of his profits. That's one way of doing it. And it's, uh, we've seen this in history. In fact, uh, I think it was mentioned in the last um, lecture that is a, there is a separate chapter in uh, Capital, Volume 1, dealing with the working day because there's been a whole struggle of workers over the last 100 years, 150 years, over this, uh, over, over, to, over of them trying to lessen the working day, reduce the hours in the working day. And uh, in fact, it was the bourgeois economists of 150 years ago were saying that's impossible because profit comes from the last hour of work. And if you, if you reduce those hours, you will reduce profits and you'll all be out of work. And that was the justification to have long working hours. But of course, a worker can, can't work longer than what? Well, can't work longer than 24 hours a day. It's impossible. Um, so they can't, and even the state has to step in and say, look, let's try and keep it, uh, keep it sane here because you're, you're squeezing workers to work 12, 14, 16 hours a day. Young children were working that 150 years ago and they were destroying them. And therefore, they, no, don't, don't let, uh, let's uh, kill the, the goose that lays the golden egg here. Let's, uh, you know, ensure the certain protection of the working class to a limited degree, which they did uh, through, through legislation. But there's another way, which is obviously, there's always a way around these things, isn't it? How to get more, how to get more profit out of the working class? Well, if you can't extend the working day over a certain amount, then what you want to do is to increase the intensity of work. 
increase the exploitation of work while the worker is in, is in, is in, your, is in your employ. And uh, the way they do this is to, dr to, to bring in machinery. Machinery helps to intensify the work process. Um, I come from Dagenham, you got a Ford, you had, well, you had a big Ford plant in, in Dagenham uh, a long time ago, and they brought in the, uh, uh, obviously, the, the, the production line. And as one comrade said earlier on, uh, they reduce the uh, skills of workers uh, so that uh, they, can, they can quickly produce as much as possible. And the production line and machinery being introduced was a, a means to, whereby the employer could squeeze more surplus value out of the labour of the working class. So that taking that uh, working day as a, as a, as a, as a norm, uh, in, before it was four hours he, he produced enough surp or enough value to cover his wages, now with an intensified um, exploitation through machinery, that worker could cover their wages now in say two hours. So you've reduced uh, this amount uh, of, uh, of necessary um, uh, labour to a bare minimum and you've vastly increased the surplus labour. And that's what the capitalists are concerned about. So you can do it in two ways. One was called the absolute surplus value, increasing the work in day. And the other was a relative surplus value, which means squeezing more out of the working, working class using machinery and technique so that they cover their wages in a less period of time and produce a greater surplus uh, for the capitalists. And that's precisely what has happened in the last 40 years, you could say, where there's been an intensity in the work, workplace. Working life has fundamentally changed compared to 40 years ago. Now it's ex extremely stressful. Uh, there's enormous... Uh, Sweated labour, basically, is taking place in, in, in factories. Con the terms and conditions have been ripped up. Real wages are being forced down. Another way you could increase, obviously, profits is to uh, reduce the wages of workers. Because at the end of the day, you know, in relation to the, uh, the economic pie, if workers get less through uh, wages, then the employers and the bosses get more in profits. It's the seesaw, if you like. And that, exactly that has also happened in the last 30, 40 years in particular, that the, the, the slice of the national income going to labour in wages has got less and less and less. And obviously the proportion going to the capitalists has increased more and more. And therefore there's been an enormous intensification of uh, exploitation of the working class throughout the Western world in particular, but everywhere. It's not just in Britain, it's everywhere. And the reason for, for that is they're, they're, through competition, they're desperate to squeeze the last ounce of unpaid labour from the working class itself. Um, of course, the, the, the capitalists operate uh, not through, uh, well, they operate through personal gain, but they also in, uh, they are also the laws of capitalism through competition, which forces them to act in a certain way. That is, they need to reduce costs in order to compete on a market. Uh, and they have competitors. They have other capitalists who also are looking to maximize their profits. But the only way they can maximize their profits is to undercut their competitors and sell more commodities. And this is uh, what's, what's also happens continuously, where each capitalist is in competition and therefore will reduce its costs by different means. They can reduce their costs by cutting uh, the living standards of their workers, introducing a, a more advanced uh, method of machines or technique, uh, which allows, allows them to uh, reduce their costs. Then they're in a position where the workers, because they got, the work is more intensified, that, the, that the, the value they produce is more now spread over more commodities. They're producing more commodities. So the, so the value that's gone into those commodities is spread more evenly. It reduces the cost of every individual item, of every individual commodity. Um, and that allows them to compete with their, uh, those who are, who are, who are their competitors.
Um, of course, they are in a position where if they reduce costs, they can undercut their competitors by reducing price, but not so far as uh, they can reduce price, but they still make a greater profit because the productivity and the value of the commodities are, are, are contain less value. So basically what they've done is um, uh, they steal, they've stealing a march on their competitors by undercutting them by producing commodities at a lower price. Uh, the only thing is that allows them to, to uh, steal extra proportion of the market and therefore they're able to get greater profits. So they make super profits by introducing the most advanced techniques into industry. The only problem is with that is that the, their competitors are also want to stay in business and the only way they can stay in business is also to adopt the same or similar techniques as this individual who's got the best ones. So eventually, all this general modern uh, uh, industry that's been introduced, the most advanced technique, becomes generalized. So no one has an advantage then. They're all, they're all basically on the same uh, uh, level pl playing ground until another one introduces better machines than they've got. And you have the process, continual process, through competition of trying to uh, reduce the value of each commodity by, by spreading the values uh, to uh, as more commodities themselves, because more commodities are produced by the machines that are being introduced. Um, so this is the, the, the driving force of, of the capitalist itself, through competition. Uh, it is true, you can say, that um, uh, we, we, we should make a kind of um, uh, an adjustment, if you like. And value is not price. Uh, that's an important concept. Um, uh, value itself is like the access, right, around which price fluctuates. fluctuates. Price itself is determined by supply and demand, which causes, if you've got, uh, you know, if there's a great uh, demand for cabbages and, uh, yeah, and the demand goes up, the supply is not as great, it forces the prices up of cabbages. Um, only thing is that has a knock-on effect in the rest of the economy as well because the capitalists are always looking for um, greater profits. And if there's a sector of the economy which is producing greater profits than themselves, they have an incentive to switch production to the more profitable sector because all they're interested, they're not interested in what they produce, whether it's magazines, books, shirts, footballs, anything you like. It doesn't matter. All they're interested in is making money, making profits. And if there's a sector of the economy which is making super profits because there's a scarcity, uh, because of, of supply and demand, then there will be a shift for, of resources from one sector to the other. They would like to get the profits. So therefore, they'll give up producing whatever it would be, uh, footballs, and they'll start producing cabbages because cabbages are much more fr profitable. The only thing is, when all that capital flows in and new factories are created and new farms are created to produce more cabbages, then there's an excess of cabbages and therefore the price tends to fall. And therefore there's an equalization or you have an average rate of profit existing in the economy like this because it's not a permanent thing because supply and demand creates all these, these inequalities and capital is immediately searching out where the maximum profit can be made in an economy itself. So you have this continual search for the maximization of, of profits. But price and value are different. Value is the kind of uh, the key nutshell, if you like, the, the, the access and the, 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 the prices are, are affected by, by supply and demand. They go up and down, but they have, are tied to the value of a commodity. So although the value of a commodity is, is the, determined by the amount of necessary uh, social necessary labor time involved in it, which is correct, it's valuable, it's value, price, the price of a commodity can fluctuate above and below this value according to the laws of supply and demand. But these are sort of surface things. It's a bit like, uh, I don't know, uh, the sea level and the different tides you get. You know, the certain tide goes out and the tide comes in, but nevertheless there's a, certain, there's a sea level which is, which is fixed. And uh, the uh, value of a commodity is the fixed item around which the 
uh, we have the fluctuation of prices. Uh, of course, the capitalist economists just focus on price. That's all they're interested in. They don't, they're not interested in value. Whereas Marxists understand you, you have to look at the real underlying fundamentals, which is the value of a commodity, and then you can understand price uh, l later on. Um, of course, the, um, this discussion about the, the, the working day reveals where profit uh, comes from and how the capitalists themselves are, are constantly looking for ways of increasing the profitability through uh, productivity deals, uh, just-in-time production, uh, various ways of squeezing more uh, labour out of the, out of the um, efforts of the working class uh, itself. Marx also tried to explain more detail about capital and how capital can be divided into two different sectors. And this has importance for, uh, as we develop the argument. And he said, well, there's, 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 there's constant capital and there's variable capital. There's two sectors. Constant capital is things such as buildings, raw materials, machinery, which are constant insofar as when they are used up in production, they don't create new value. They just um, gradually transfer the value, their own value to the new commodity. Yeah, so even a machine, although it doesn't do it immediately, over a period of five or ten years, gradually it will become obsolete. And after that period of time, that machine would have transferred the value of itself to the commodities that it's produced over a longer period of time. Um, then you've got electricity, power, all the things that go with making up a commodity in that form, constant capital, which just simply transfers its own um, value to the new commodities, it's constant, i.e. constant value. Variable capital is what Marx explained was wages. The capital which is, which, which spend, which is spent in wages and employs labour power. And the reason why it's uh, variable is because this is the source by which new value is created. Machinery doesn't create it, it's, it's labour. You can see that even by, well, just take this, just common sense. You go to a factory, you can look at a factory, you can look at it all day, you can look at it all year. It doesn't do anything. Machinery, you can lie idle, it doesn't do anything. It fa in fact, it uh, depreciates, it, it rots away, it rusts, if you just look at it. Only when you have the application of human labour, of workers employed to, to work the machines, do you have, the develop, do you have pr real production and the development of new values. The machinery and all the other constant capital simply transfers their already existing value to new commodities, but the application of, of human labour power produces new values, extra value. And that's why the capitalists, that's where the profit comes from. Otherwise, if the capitalists were simply paid for their labour, then what's the point in going into business? Because they, they, they know the capitalists would not make any profit. The profit has to come from somewhere. And it can't come from um, you know, uh, buying cheaply and, and selling more dearly, because uh, you know, it's like swings and roundabouts. Eventually, you will have to buy more dear of someone else uh, so it's, and, and sell cheaply, etc. It's, it's, it's just a circular motion. There's no extra value created in that particular uh, way, way of doing business. It does happen, but there's, there's no, you just take, take from Peter to pay Paul, that's all. You're just transferring the same amount of value from one hand to another. You're not creating any extra value. And the only way you can get extra value is the work employed by the working class itself in order to um, produce new um, values uh, and, and commodities. Of course, uh, this is important insofar as what has the history of capitalism shown us? It's shown us that uh, there's a greater concentration and a greater centralization of capital. Out of every crisis, 
is uh, born, uh, is destroyed, the, the weaker sectors, and, new, and the, the bigger powerful monopolies become even more powerful. The banks become even more greater in, in, in its power and influence. So uh, this is the, the, the natural progress and development of capitalism is bigger machinery, bigger factories, more advanced production, where workers are getting more and more excluded from production because of the productivity of labor. Instead of, uh, producing, instead of employing 100 workers, you won't need to. You can now, produce, you now employ 20 workers, and they, because of the machinery and technique that's available, will produce, this, produce the same amount or more than 100 workers previously. So the general thrust of capitalism is to increase constant capital at the expense of variable capital of the workers. The problem being, it's the workers who produce the surplus value. It's the workers who produce the new values. And if, you, if you're squeezing them out, then that has a consequence. And the consequence has been a natural tendency in capitalism for the rate of profit to decline. Where, in other words, if you have a, a lot, because profit is, is determined by the surplus value created uh, uh, in relation to the total capital employed. And if the total capital employed is getting bigger and bigger, and the amount of uh, surplus value is, in relation is smaller, then obviously you're going to have a, a falling, or a tendency for the rate of profit to fall. Uh, and that has been a, a problem for capitalism since its uh, inception. Of course, it doesn't happen. There are countervailing factors. Otherwise, it would just fall and fall and fall and fall and fall. And presumably, presumably when you reach zero, the capitalists then will just you know hang themselves because they can't make any profit. They'll just give up. But that doesn't happen, of course. Um, there are tendencies which counter um, uh, counter influence this, ten this, this, this tendency for the rate of profit to fall, countervailing tendencies. And that comes largely through, let's get just a couple of examples, um, the exploitation of the working class. If you can intensify the exploitation, like we've said before, relative surplus value being created, that can increase the, the uh, or counteract the falling rate of profit. And that's been happening now again I mean, in the 1960s, there had been quite a decline in the rate of profit in British industry, right up actually until about 1970, in the 70s. And then you had Thatcherism, uh, and with Thatcherism, you had a, a, a counter-revolution in the factory floor, defeat of the miners, defeat of all section of workers, and a brutal regime imposed in the factories and the workplaces. Inefficient plants, as they call it, were shut down and they concentrated in more profitable plants. But there was an almost onslaught against the working class. And because of that, the rate of profit began to rise in the 90, late 1980s, the 1990s, and in the 2000s, up until 2008, there was a rise in the rate of profit because of an increased intensity and increased exploitation of the working class. Also, other markets opened up in other parts of the world, in China, globalization, provided them with new outlets for their, for their goods and so on. These acted as, as countervailing factors of this fall tendency, so that's what it was called, a tendency for the rate of profit to decline itself. So, that, so there are numerous pressures and numerous contradictions in the capitalism, but the biggest contradiction of all, really, is the fact that the working class cannot buy back the full values that it produces. Uh, because you know, if it did, there would be no profit. Uh, they only get a, the, the, the profit is unpaid labor of the working class. So the workers as a whole cannot buy back what they produce. And that produces a, a major contradiction and a headache for capitalism. How can capitalism survive then? You know, if, if no one will buy its goods, if they, it will collapse in a state of overproduction from the day one. But it didn't, and the reason for that, that the capitalists were able to overcome this contradiction by taking the surplus produced by the working class and investing it back into machinery, back into production, and creating a further market for capitalism itself through capital goods 
then the workers employed in the capital goods industries would spend their money on consumer uh, goods, which in turn would set the world ball, ball go, going again and develop the economy. So the capitalists were able to get around this uh, problem um, where the workers couldn't buy back from them the full value they produced by, by taking the surplus and investing it to create a new market. And therefore, Bob's your uncle, you solved the problem. But there's a catch. And the catch is that you, if the capitalists are, are investing this uh, surplus value into new machinery, new technique, they're producing enormous amounts of extra capacity in the economy. So they are, they are now, their economy produces far more goods than before. And of course, uh, there comes a time, there comes a point when there's a crisis. And the crisis is that of overproduction. It's never occurred anywhere in other forms of historical society. In other forms of society prior to capitalism, you had a crisis of underproduction. You didn't produce enough, therefore people starved. Whereas under capitalism, you have a crisis now of overproduction. Although, let, let's also qualify that. Overproduction on the basis of private profit. It's not overproduction for the needs of society, of course. You know, people need a lot of things. Houses, carpets, you name it, they need it. But they can't have access to it because they haven't got the money to buy it. So it's not the needs of society. It's the needs of this overproduction is linked to the to the profitability and interest of capitalism. Uh, so they, they reach a point where there's an overproduction for capitalism. Capitalism, in other words, cannot make any more profit out of extra production because they cannot sell it. Because at the end of the day, um, profit comes from the production of commodities, but commodities have to be sold in order to realize the value contained in them. So in other words, the market is just as, as important as the production. Both are linked. And the problem of capitalism it is uh, a society, ultimately, which um, it fosters uh, a, a, an economy which produces to the maximum, because they have to. Each of them are competing against one another. At the same time, they're cutting the market. Why? Because they're cutting costs. They, re they want workers to, to, get, to, to work more for less wages, etc., etc. So they cut the market at a time where they're vastly in trying to increase the output of capitalism. And that reaches a crisis, crisis point, and you have a, a, a crisis of overproduction. That took place in 2008. There were other ones in the past, but 2008 was a classic one. World trade collapsed. Um, people were made uh, unemployed, factories were closed down, uh, factories were bankrupt, some were mothballed. Um, you have a destruction of capital. You think about it, that's what happens in a crisis. The system now has produced too much, and the only way it can get out of this crisis is eliminate the overproduction. So they just, what they call, uh, creative destruction is the word that the capitalist uses. In other words, they have to destroy the industry. They have to destroy the, the machinery in order to, um, to survive. And capitalism does this through economic crisis. It's, it's crazy, I know. It's, it's bedlam. But that's the only way capitalism can function. So you have idle workers facing idle factories and idle machinery. That's the, the, the definition of a capitalist crisis. Um, however, just as the seeds of a crisis were contained in a boom, so also the seeds of recovery are contained within a slump. Because the slump itself does the job of destroying the excess capacity that's been created, the overproduction that's been created, and therefore allows capitalism to restore a certain rate of profit because uh, all, the, all the bankrupt indices are destroyed, all the weakest ones are, 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 have gone to the wall, and therefore, on, the, on a new basis, there's the beginnings of a recovery take, that takes place. And this is not just the, the physical destruction of factories and machinery, which does occur through, through rusting and, 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 uh, and so on, through Ill, Ill use. They, they're no good. They have to be scrapped. 
but also values are destroyed. I mean, if you, if you looked at the television in 2008, they said, oh my God, we've just, the banks have reported that the uh, shares on the stock markets have resulted in, you know, $12 trillion being destroyed, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, all this, this value has, has gone up in smoke. It's, you could say it's paper value, but it's all gone up in smoke. And uh, therefore, on the basis of this destruction, you have the, the, the um, conditions are created for a recovery of capitalism. And here you have the, the gradual development of, of investment taking place, because now it's more profitable to do so. And with investment, you take on more labor. When you take on more labor, you produce, you get a, a greater market. You buy in different goods, you buy in different, uh, re renewing your machinery. All this creates a, a, a market now and stimulates the development of capitalism itself. And that's how we're, you have the emergence of a recovery in capitalist society. Uh, of course, uh, there's, a, there's a, a slight thing we need to understand here. That's the theory. Um, in the last 10 years, there should have been a recovery. There hasn't been. Or the recovery has been the weakest in history. And the reason for that, that capitalism has exhausted itself. As an economic system, it's now reaching its limits. Just as capitalism and slavery went into decline and also prepared the way for a new society, so also capitalism has reached its limits insofar as it's carved up the world to begin with. It's, it's, it's financed monopoly capitalism on a world scale. It's imperialism. It's the highest stage it can develop to. Um, and it's become a barrier to itself. And that's why there's no, been no real recovery. It, it, and now there's going to be another world slump. So right, in other words, we've missed the real recovery, and they're going for a world slump instead. And this world slump is going, a slump is going to be really, really deep. Even the um, governor of the Bank of England said uh, a couple of weeks ago that we're, going, it's, it's, uh, we're in danger because of automation. Uh, and that we could return into conditions of the 19th century where the workers were not getting paid, or the, the share of the working class when getting paid was getting less and less. That's true. But now we're going to have a world trade war on our hands as well. Uh, even today's paper in the Financial Times talked about uh, uh, China and America uh, facing one another off. And Trump has made the, the great uh, uh, ploy of uh, demanding the Chinese within two years cut their surplus by two thirds which is impossible, but nevertheless, this is the, 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 uh, the way things are moving. And on, on, on the base of a new world slump, there'll be protectionism. And with protectionism, as in 1930, 31, that can drive the world economy into a depression, not just a slump, a depression that can last for how long? The only reason why the depression in the 1930s ended was the Second World War. We can't have, a set, have another world war because it would destroy the entire planet. Even the capitalists don't want to do that because they, they, you know, they want to make profits. So they, therefore, you'll have a continual deep crisis or depression of capitalism. And it's in, in that context that the working class's consciousness will change dramatically and you will have revolutionary developments on a world scale. Doesn't mean to say everything's connected to that, but if capitalism can offer a world way out, working conditions are being driven down, mass unemployment's going to take place. Those are the conditions whereby revolutionary uh, consciousness will develop on, on a world scale, as happened in the 1920s and the 1930s. So economics is an important aspect. That's why Marx actually um, spent most of his life studying it, to, to go into the, the, the nuts and bolts of this, these laws that govern capitalism, to prepare the working class for what's coming, uh, but to understand also the limits of the capitalist system, and that it has to give way to a new form of society where private property is, profit is done away with, and we have the planning, the rational planning of the resources of the planet in the interests of people itself, which would allow us to not have a mass unemployment, but would allow us to reduce the work in week, for instance, to possibly 20 hours or 10 hours, and have an enormous increase in, yes, in automation, to lighten the burden of work. But if it's done in a planned way, we can get the benefits of this, rather than a tiny handful of people who are there to speculate on the lives of ordinary, ordinary workers. So that's the importance of uh, economics, that's the importance of Marxist economics, which gives us a view of what we are, we're about to see.
uh, the contradictions which are insoluble, and the need, therefore, to understand the only way forward is the overthrow of capitalism. And it's not us who will learn those lessons, but the working class itself will learn those lessons painfully by experience, by the events that will face them, and prepare the way for a socialist revolution in Britain and internationally.